The scientists and engineers of the Central Kerbin Alliance Network have been working very diligently to incorporate the latest radar and missile technology into the newest generation of fighter aircraft. With strained relations all over the globe, the K-10 Wonder will most likely see action very soon. This is Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. On this pre-dawn mission, Didi Kerman will be taking out the new K-101 to test out its new missile and radar technology. The target today is an unmanned drone. If everything performs as expected, the targets tomorrow may be communist MiGs. Due to its similarities to the communist fighter, a K-86 is launched as the target drone. DD launches three semi-active radar homing missiles at the target. He is able to maintain radar lock through the entire engagement and destroy the target. From an initial perspective, the test flight seems to be a resounding success. DD reports that the plane also handles very well. A highly advanced fighter like this in the capable hands of a pilot like DD Kerman could very well turn the tides of this conflict fully in favor of the Central Kerbin Alliance Network. It seems that the Alliance Brass is also very pleased with how this fighter is performing. They said that they would like serial production to start yesterday. As dawn breaks, a new day in the era of jet combat begins. The day of the missile. The first test will come soon. But until that day comes, there is some science that needs to be conducted. Apparently, that smudge that scientists have been seeing on their telescopes isn't a crumb. It's actually another moon that goes around Kerbin. So now there's a debate about whether the moon is actually made out of glass or some kind of mint ice cream. Therefore, a probe must be sent to find out this answer. The interface that you see me bringing up on the screen right now is from the mod Configurable Containers. It is very useful for letting you change what resources are used inside of different containers. In this case, the tank is normally just for liquid fuel, and I wanted liquid fuel and oxidizer in there, so the mod lets me change that. This probe will need plenty of solar panels to be able to run three ScanSat experiments simultaneously. The three contracts call for a radar altimetry scan, a high-resolution image scan, and a multi-spectral scan. The contract to fly by Minmus just requires that some form of science gets transmitted back to Kerbin. So, in addition to the ScanSat experiments, this probe will also contain a barometer and a thermometer. Those two experiments are placed out on the image scanner to help balance the weight of the probe so that the center of thrust will align with the center of mass. The probe is securely strutted to the base of the fairing so that it won't wobble around during ascent. The fairing just helps protect some of the more sensitive parts against the aerodynamic forces during ascent. The second stage of the rocket only needs a tiny amount of fuel to help finish the circularization. It will also use a couple Terrier engines to help provide enough thrust. A single Bobcat is more than sufficient as a first stage engine. Lastly, four small fins are placed on the base of the rocket to help provide a little bit of aerodynamic stability during ascent. This rocket will be more than capable to reach orbit around Minmus. With the high thrust to weight ratio of the first stage, this rocket is able to take a very aggressive gravity turn. After Miko, the second stage fires up and begins to power this rocket the rest of the way into orbit. With the desired apoapsis achieved, the second stage engines cut off and the fairings are jettisoned in the upper atmosphere. The rocket coasts to its apoapsis, where it will fire its engines again to finish its circularization around Kerbin. The probe will finish its own circularization burn so that the second stage will burn up in the atmosphere. Once in orbit, a maneuver out to Minmus is plotted. The launch has been well timed so that the maneuver out to Minmus will take it near the descending node. Therefore, no inclination change is needed to reach the moon. Even though Minmus is much further away from Kerbin than the Mun is, it only takes a little bit more delta V to reach it. The probe's trajectory takes it directly over the North Pole of Minmus. This is perfect, as the ScanSat experiments work best in a polar orbit. As the probe enters its sphere of influence, it takes some initial readings to send back to Kerbin. Shortly thereafter, the probe performs a couple burns to get itself into a 120 km high orbit around the moon. Such an odd looking moon. Was it naturally part of the Kerbin system? 
or was it an asteroid that was captured at some point later on? The large, flat areas look like good places to begin surface operations. With the probe in orbit, it begins its attempt to unlock the secrets of this strange moon. Back on Kerbin, agents from the rogue nation of North Kerbia are attempting to block access to the island airfield, with only one of the new K-101s available. Didi takes it to confront the aggressors. Intelligence indicates that two North Kerbian fighters have landed on the island airfield and refueled. Hopefully, Didi's new fighter performs as well as it did in testing. Didi activates his radar and begins scanning for contacts. With a small ridge blocking the view of the airfield, he probably won't see them until they are airborne. That bit of cover works both ways, as Didi can fly in within missile range before they notice him. The two fighters scramble to confront Didi, and now the two bandits are visible on Didi's radar. Didi, you are free to engage. Didi gets a lock on one of the fighters. The pilots from North Kerbia look like they've never fought a plane armed with missiles before. They keep flying straight at him. As long as Didi's missiles work as intended, this will be a turkey shoot. Otherwise, these planes could get in close and tear up Didi's fighter with their guns. Fox 1. Didi fires his first missile towards the hostile. The missile is locked on and tracking towards the target. The North Kerbian sees the missile. Now the plane spins and tries to dive and get out of the way, but the missile is locked on and scratch one MiG. That leaves just one more hostile for Didi to deal with. However, it's no longer on his radar. The enemy is attempting to get on Didi's tail. Didi continues flying full throttle towards the island to get some distance between himself and the enemy. With some room to maneuver, he banks to his left and is going to begin scanning for the enemy again. It now appears that the North Kerbian fighter is in between Didi and the Space Center. Didi now rolls to his right in an attempt to get a radar lock on the enemy again. And again, Didi is able to line up his shot with the enemy and Fox 1. His second missile heads towards the enemy. There is no escape and Didi scores his second victory of the day. With all the hostiles cleared from the area, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network can once again continue its work at the island airfield. However, the Alliance has now tipped its hand by using this new fighter in combat. This will assuredly encourage the Communists to develop some kind of counter to this new technology. But until the Communists do find an answer, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network will have the edge in fighter combat. If you have enjoyed this video, would you please consider activating the like button? And if you are so inclined, would you leave a comment sharing your thoughts on this video and what you thought so far about the Cold War series? What do you think will happen next? And what do you think the communists are up to on the Moon? With the skies cleared, Didi returns back to the Space Center. After landing his aircraft, Didi suggests that perhaps the Space Center and the Island Airfield could use their own dedicated defense force. Alliance leadership says that they will take this under consideration. I am Echo3, and thanks for joining me to discuss the Cold War. I will see you next time.